Tonight, a quantum special as we go to the national capital for the official opening of the National Science and Technology Centre. Hello and welcome to Quantum. As you can see tonight, we're doing something different, as are the scientists that are standing out in the rain here tonight demonstrating against cuts in science. And we'll also be telling you what this centre is all about. Hundred guests from science, industry and politics have gathered here tonight to see the Prime Minister do the honours when he declares the centre open with a high-tech version of cutting the ribbon. However, there's already been action of a different sort here tonight. Earlier, a large crowd gathered nearby to rally for more government support for science. It seems that the people Science Minister Barry Jones condemned as political wimps a few years back have learnt some of the tricks involved in fighting for a bigger share of the budget. But if there aren't enough dollars going into research, quite a few have already found their way into the centre. Priority given to the new building is clear when you see just where it's been positioned in Canberra. A major bicentennial project, the new centre is located just down the road from the High Court. Not far from the new Parliament House, it sits on some of the national capital's prime real estate. To justify such an address, the National Science and Technology Centre has to play a special role. Its aim is to bring a new awareness to just what science and technology can do to both our daily lives and the world around us. You get some idea of just how it's going to do that when you move inside. The building is divided into galleries, each exploring a different aspect of science and technology. As we'll see later, it does that with an energetic mixture of hands-on exhibits and demonstrations where visitors can experience for themselves the forces and thoughts which make up science and its theories. But first, it's over to my co-host for tonight and Quantum's special guest from the science shows on ABC Radio, Robin Williams. Thanks, Karina. Well, this is the man who made it all happen, Mike Gore, the first director of the National Science and Technology Centre, who began Questacon ten years ago in a lonely school in Canberra. Do you remember those days? I do indeed, Robin. What made you start Questacon? Oh, it's the idea I got from the United States, from the Exploratorium in San Francisco. It wasn't so much the idea, the way it had the effect on me, it was the way it affected my wife and my three children. They thought it was marvellous, and I thought, if non-scientists like it, it's got to be good. Yeah, but do you remember that schoolroom open two days a week by appointment only? <laughs> it's a long time ago now, yes, indeed. Two days a week and 45 kids at a time, yeah. We've come a long way since then. Where did you scrounge the gear? Oh, you name it, just about everywhere. Every organisation in Canberra, scientific organisation, helped to build things. And then, within about two or three years, I went to Sydney and Melbourne and they started the pitching as well. Well, did people take you seriously in the beginning? Did they think you were a bit of a Don Quixote? I got some peculiar looks at times, I must confess, yes. Especially when I said it could lead to a National Science Centre. I think in the beginning I didn't really believe it myself. Yeah. But it wasn't until the Australian Bicentennial got into the act, about 1982, and then, yes. then there was the first glimmer of hope. And how many of the objects in this Science Centre have you made yourself? Me personally, or the team? The team. Oh. You've got a team, of course. Oh, just about all of them, except yeah. the dinosaurs, which we'll see later, yeah. and uh, the IBM Mathematica exhibition. Those that was built in Sydney, and the dinosaurs were built in Japan. And do the kids take to them, or all are they the... puzzled by them? What, the dinosaurs? All of them, the instruments, the games, the sorts of things that teach them physics. I don't think they're puzzled. Uh, I think they have a great time. Quite often they don't fully understand what's going on, especially little people, yes. but they can feel the excitement of the place. And that's what we're after, to really yes. build up a spirit of excitement and to look for things, to search yes, for things. Yes. Of course, the Academy of Science had something to do with this in the first place too, didn't they? Mm -hmm. yes. so they threw their way behind it, yes. yes. Well, that's how far we've come in ten years. Let's see how it all began. <laughs> Questacon used to live here in this vacant Canberra schoolhouse, left over from the 1920s. It may seem a modest start for something as grandiose as the new science centre, but that didn't bother Mike Gore back in the 70s. He was out to prove something many people still find hard to accept, that it's possible to have a good time playing with science. What we're doing, really, is to provide a laboratory for the public where the equipment doesn't need any great skill, where anybody from age 5 to 95 can use it, they get a buzz out of doing it, 
and many of them will learn things or be stimulated to go elsewhere to learn things. I don't see this as a place just primarily for learning things, where people are coming at one end like a sausage machine and be turned out the other end as, as Einstein's, as people like to say to me. I see it as a place where people go away and say, gee, I didn't realize that, and that's the sort of feeling we want people, and gee, I must find out more about that. The objective? To make a visit to Questacon as different as possible to the traditional passive museum with its look but don't touch atmosphere. To do this, he needed exhibits that would absorb years of youthful punishment while faithfully repeating their science demonstrations thousands of times. In the end, the designs they came up with survived so well that many of these machines, originally intended only as prototypes, were moved directly into the new center. But no matter how tough or inventive the hardware, the Questacon machines, just like those in science generally, were only tools. What Gorn needed was a friendly and patient team who would guide inquiring minds around the scientific principles of the exhibits. Enter the explainers. The great success of the explainers is they came from a very wide spectrum of the Canberra community. It's very important not only to show people scientific concepts and let them experiment for themselves, it, it, vitally important that they see how those particular concepts are used in everyday situations and that's where the explainers come in. Over its eight-year life, Questacon has given Mike Gore continuing opportunities to experiment with different ways to infuse people about science. Lessons that have now been applied within the shining walls of the new center. Questacon means to seek and to study. They're not traditional Australian pastimes, but when Gore and his explainers opened their doors, over half a million people poured through. The way it's appealed to the average person in the street, something that one woman wrote in our visitor's book on one occasion, it's probably the, the, the comment I'm most proudest of. She wrote, my three children have been in this center for four hours, and not once in that time have they ever asked for food or drink. Well, the kids are obviously having tremendous fun, but do you think they're learning anything from it? I think they learn a lot. The thing is, you've got to remember about a place like this, it's not just a place of formal learning, of teaching. This is a place of stimulation, where we want to get people interested. We want to let them roam freely and experiment for themselves. It's just like research. Really good research is done by people who are left alone to go and trammel. Yes, uh, but you've got people there. It's not just machines. You have people oh, talking yes, we have as, explainers. as we saw. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. The one thing you've got with this amazing building, uh, are you going to stay here in the national capital isolated from the rest of Australia or seek out as you've traditionally done? Oh, well, there's two angles. No, we're not going to stay here. This is the hub. This is the beginning mm. of it. This mm. is the middle. We've already got the Questacon Science Circus on the road. It's been to 26 centres around Australia yeah. in this bicentennial year. But what I want to see, the dream that I want to see in the next 10 years, is that we have a whole ring of interactive yeah. science centres yeah. right around Australia. And that's going to happen. Thanks, Michael. We'll talk to you later. Well, whatever those plans for the future, some of the exhibits already here at the National Science Centre are quite startling. Here's Andrew Waterworth with some moving monsters not seen hereabouts for 65 million years. <laughs> Dinosaurs dominated the Earth for 140 million years. It was during a time known as the Mesozoic Era, from 245 to 65 million years ago. And then, for some reason still shrouded in mystery, the dinosaur dynasty came to an end. But here in the dinosaur gallery, the past has been recreated. Although these dinosaurs aren't all life-size, they're certainly very lifelike. This is not the way dinosaurs have always been seen. These are active, agile creatures. Some may even be warm-blooded. How they stand, how they move, the way they look, is all based on the very latest evidence unearthed by paleontologists. 
you get a skeleton, you have to go to the dinosaurs that have more complete skeletons than just an odd bone or two. You look at the bumps and squiggles on the bones, which give you some idea of where the muscles attach, where the ligaments attach. And then by looking at modern reptiles, which are the closest things that we have to dinosaurs, you look at what those squiggles and bumps on their bones mean about attachment of muscles, about size of muscles and ligaments. And then from there, you look at how they move and you make the, the interpretation from the modern forms to the fossil forms. This Mutaburrosaurus, for example, lived 95 million years ago here in Australia. It's related to a group of dinosaurs called Iguanodontids and was a land-based plant eater. It's characterized by an extraordinary bump on its nose, which may have been to help it smell or used as an amplifier to make loud noises such as mating or warning calls. Then there's the Stegosaurus, which lived about 50 million years before Mataburosaurus in North America. The latest scientific theory suggests that the large triangular plates on this plant-eating dinosaur's back were for heat regulation rather than defense. It's that sort of information that the Japanese company which built these dinosaurs took into account as they were designing these fascinating creatures from the past. Using the latest technology and materials, they've managed to breathe new life into the bare bones of paleontological postulation. Polyurethane foam encases the inner structure of the dinosaur to create the right shape. Then nylon, mesh and silicon rubber are added to produce the authentic looking skin. But what makes these dinosaurs really special is their movements. Compressed air is pumped into the bodies and a system of valves directs it to heads, tails, arms and legs, giving it a complex series of movements which helps create the sense of being lifelike. Um, I didn't expect anything like this. I thought they would be made, wouldn't move, and I thought they would must have been made out of paper mache or something like that. All the lighting that looks like their natural habitat. Everything looks as if they're alive and about to eat you and all this sort of stuff. Scientifically and personally, they're interesting because this was a very, very successful group. It lived for a long time. It was very dominant for 100, 140 million years, and then it became extinct. Now, there's lessons, I think, that we humans can learn from that. We've not been around here very long at all, maybe a few hundred thousand years, our species. Uh, why did the dinosaurs go extinct may be very relevant to our understanding how we may survive in the future. The sounds are electronically synthesized and synchronized with mouth movements by computer. In fact, the whole system is controlled by computer chips, which can be reprogrammed. So the movements you see here today can actually be altered to suit the location of tomorrow. And that's important, because this is designed to be a travelling exhibition. From January 1989, these dinosaurs will form an all-star prehistoric circus doing a whistle-stop tour of Australia. Somehow, I think they're going to be a roaring success. We're all familiar with the success of Japanese technology, and of course their marketing skills are legendary. But as Jill Emberson reports, more and more Australians are now learning to do things the Japanese way. Australia saw just what an impact the Japanese approach to technology and management could have back in 1980, when Mitsubishi took over the Chrysler plant in Adelaide. In just one year, the approach which has seen the Japanese come to dominate global car production took an ailing plant, facing closure, to a $1 million profit. The results should not have come as a surprise. It was this approach that enabled Japan to work itself out of the ruins of World War II into global economic dominance. More recently, Australians have been getting to know another representative of the Japanese corporate state in Mr. Okimura. Featured in a series of national TV commercials for NEC, Mr. Okimura spreads the message that not only are the Japanese here to do business, but they now want to be a part of the local community. Telephone for a uh, Mr. Okimura. NEC, Japan's most experienced computer company, now very much at home in Australia. Behind the jokes, though, corporations like NEC are putting down Australian roots. They set up here in 1969, but in the last few years, they've expanded beyond the limits of the traditional branch office. 
Today, NEC designs products locally for international distribution and it has regular exchange programs between Australian and Japanese engineers. In the past three years, we have improved our design and manufacturing dramatically because there are devaluation happened and Japanese globalization policy changed. We are very happy to work with Australian people and we would like to improve more with the joint efforts of Australian and Japanese. Another example of Japan's changing relationship with Australia is here at the National Science and Technology Centre. Japanese government and industry have been big contributors of the $20 million cost of the new centre. But just as the Japanese have been reshaping their relationship with Australia, they've also been rethinking their whole approach to science. This is the Tron project at Tokyo University. Short for real-time operating system Nucleus, Tron marks a major commitment by the Japanese to basic research. In this case, with computers. It marks a major departure from the traditional post-war approach of applying ideas developed elsewhere. Put simply, Tron calls for Japan to develop its own microprocessors and operating systems with the aim of developing a single system that will make all the world's computers compatible. Here in Australia, Japan's quest for original research and a cooperative relationship with trading partners could find shape in an incredible new project still only on the drawing boards. Called a multi-function polis, the concept calls for a $20 billion investment over 20 years to build a city of the future, dedicated to research and cultural exchange. It's the response of a Japan keenly sensitive to criticism that it's only interested in hard-nosed business deals. Not surprisingly, the multifunction polis works around the idea of Australians and Japanese feeling good about working with each other. Those lessons are already being learnt in the local car industry and the electronics world. In both those cases, however, it's Japanese know-how which has shown the way, just as the multifunction polis is a Japanese initiative. Whether Australians can learn by example and use their abilities to be an equal partner in determining their future, or just react to an agenda laid down by an energetic Japan, remains to be seen. Although the National Science and Technology Centre is based in Canberra, it aims to spread its message across the whole country. Well, you can't take the building on tour, but with a little thought, they've done the next best thing. This truck is helping to spread the new word of science out beyond the black stump to every corner of the continent. In this year alone, it's covered over 15,000 kilometres on six separate tours. Today, they're in outback Queensland, heading for the town of Kanamala. The Shell Questacon Science Circus is fronted by an enthusiastic team of explainers who use big top showmanship to sell some fairly tricksy science. We will have the slime show. Now, the slime show is one of our very popular shows. Put up like this, and it becomes almost as thick as bread dough. <laughs> In shows like this one, and dozens of other interactive demonstrations, the aim is to let kids experience science as never before. Outside in the park, another group are catching a show on Dreamtime technology and learning how boomerangs work. Each of these wings on the boomerang is shaped like the wing of an aeroplane. And the way the wind that rushes over those wings 
helps keep the wings up, pushes them up and keeps them in the sky. And for those with the stomach for it, some novel insights into indigestion, using some very basic but appropriate props. And it's called an antacid. So that means anti-acid. So when we pour it into the stomachs, just like we drink it, and I'll give Charlie a drink here of Melanta, watch what happens to Charlie's stomach. Blue, that's right. See that? So we've fixed Charlie up now. The explainers are all recent university graduates. The trick for them is to switch these young minds on to science. I think it, it gives them an understanding that science is something that they can understand and science is part of their everyday life, even though they mightn't have anything to do with university science or anything to do with research science. But even the science they have in their homes, in their environment, it is, involves them and it is part of their life. I realise that, um, that scientists do have to get involved with the community more and present their ideas clearly to other people and if you can't tell anybody what you're doing then no one's going to help you with your work. The buzz of science has always been about discovery and there's nothing better than hands-on exhibits or in this case feet on. Whether it's finding out for themselves how ice skaters spin so fast or using the motion of a pendulum to plot intricate patterns. These exhibits create their own fascination. And to get one that crosses over like that, I've got to make these go in opposite directions. Right? So one's going clockwise, one's going anti-clockwise in big circles. Then we just put it down. It's not every day that a show like this comes to Kanamala. And many of the people here today have travelled a long way to see it. The children are on School of the Air and it was on the radio for them at 8.30 on Friday morning so we just thought it'd be interesting and we came in and had a look this afternoon. Putting difficult concepts within the grasp of children is forging valuable links between science and the community and they get a kick out of it too. More interesting than at school because it's got more things to do. Never had anything like this ever before. It's real good. I've made science interesting for me. Oh, it's just different. <laughs> if any um, science group come back to Kalamara, I'd be, I'd be back here like fly around a dead fox. After a highly successful six-week tour, the circus is packing up and heading south. See you later, Kalamara! They're leaving southern Queensland, but the show's only just begun. Where there's community interest and a hall for hire, the circus could be coming to town. A force is a push, a pull, a twist. A force makes things move, changes the way things move, and stops things from moving. A force is any action that maintains or alters the position of a physical body or distorts it. In this gallery, the forces are with you. Here you can wrestle to your heart's content with the natural phenomena that sparked the curiosity of early physicists. There are four known forces that shape and control our lives. The strong and weak forces between atoms, electromagnetism and gravity. While most of these forces are too small to see with the naked eye, how they relate to what we do is clearly demonstrated here in this gallery. The Gravitram is really just a fun machine, but it does display kinetic energy. That's the energy of motion. We can see the same kinetic energy in funfair rides as well as in aerobatics, when daredevil pilots appear to defy gravity as they loop the loop.
In fact, motion is at the heart of everything, from the smallest atom to the largest galaxy. This exhibit helps illustrate the way planets and comets move as they orbit around the Sun in our solar system. What keeps the planets in orbit is gravity. We're familiar with gravity as the force which pulls things down towards the Earth. But in fact, any two objects attract each other with a gravitational force. An intense gravitational pull is responsible for what astronomers call the black hole, a region of space where matter is tremendously compressed by the force of gravity. The pull is so strong that nothing, not even light, can move fast enough to escape the black hole. This electrifying exhibit is called Jacob's Ladder. By harnessing another force called electromagnetism, its high voltage transformer can generate up to 15,000 volts in an impressive continuous electrical discharge. Now that sounds like a lot, but it's a lot less than lightning, which works on the same principle. Earthquakes are another powerful natural phenomenon. Produced by forces trapped deep within the Earth, they're certainly a force to be reckoned with. One of the more shattering experiences you can have in the forces gallery is here on the earthquake simulator. At the press of a button, you can submit yourself to a range of intensities. I think this one measures about 5.8 on the Richter scale, sufficient to cause quite a bit of damage, and certainly enough for a good shake, rattle and roll, which is basically what this gallery is all about. Another go, kids? Yeah. OK, hang on. OK, here we go. Hang on. That's pretty realistic. Well, you never do nothing to save me or talk on the soul. Shake, run and roll! Andrew Waterwork, with a little help from Bill Haley and the Comets. Well, we've heard about Mike Gore, but another great force behind this Science Centre is, of course, the Minister for Science, Barry Jones. What do you think of it, Minister? I think it's wonderful. It's something I've dreamed about for a long time. I've looked forward to uh, this night for a long time, and I'm glad to be here. Do you think hands-on works as such? Yes, I've observed it in Japan and in Germany and in Canada, and I think it has been very successful, particularly in that area of demystification. I think it's also very important because of its symbolic significance that it's here, it's together with all the other palaces, the Palace of the Arts, the Palace of, of the Law, the Palace of the People up on uh, Capitol Hill. I think it's very important to reinforce the fact that it is part of our national culture. And will it be, bring children back to science, youngsters? Well, I think the most important thing is not just this building, but the outreach program, the fact that we've got these pantechnicons, wonderful word, out going to areas where people don't see things. Remember our good friend uh, Peter Mason always thought that was the major element that ought to be in this, getting science out, but having a focal point, a reference point that you see as the centre. We've just had a rally, as we've seen, uh, of scientists asking for more resources. You spoke at that rally. What did you say? Well, I said sort of the sort of philosophical things that perhaps more appropriate on the science show, even more appropriate on Occam's razor. It wasn't exactly what they wanted to hear. I'm sorry they couldn't be in here to hear the Prime Minister's speech, because the Prime Minister, I thought, made a very handsome gesture uh, about what he thought that we'd be doing and that more resources would be made available. That the uh, Committee of Officials, with that wonderful acronym GOO, the group of officials, won't be bringing down cosmetic changes. It will be doing something substantial. And it's not a matter of a quick fix. It's something for the long term. And that was the emphasis of the Prime Minister's speech. Yes, I'm looking forward to the fact that we might see something of the Prime Minister's speech. But um, will it be another committee making another recommendation? Or will no, it no, be... No. He says the preliminary decision will be brought down next week. And that's when the decision will, be, will go before SAC. Well, thanks very much indeed, Minister Jones. I hope you're absolutely proud of this centre. And with all that discussion of present crises, let's not forget that Australia does have remarkable achievements in research. Here's a sample.
over the past century, science and technology have changed our world so much, it's difficult to step away from it and see things as they really were. And as we zoom towards the 90s, Australian science is up there with the best. This is NASA's proposed space plane, one of several multi-billion dollar transports of the future. But without this facility, the T4 shock tunnel at Queensland University, it's unlikely the space plane will ever get off the ground. This huge tube is a hypersonic wind tunnel, the fastest in the world. Working like a cannon in reverse, it fires parcels of air at speeds up to eight kilometers per second, past test models of aircraft and revolutionary new kinds of engines. The tests only last for a split second, but that's time enough to tell whether one design or another could break the bonds of Earth. In biomedical research too, there's a long tradition of Australian innovation. Projects like the bionic ear, developed by Professor Graham Clark. By implanting this tiny device deep inside the ear, the profoundly deaf can understand running speech and communicate with the world. In the search for greater understanding of how the human body operates, a number of Australian research institutes have gained international stature. Notable among them is the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute in Melbourne. Since its beginnings in 1915 under Sir Macfarlane Burnett, it has pioneered studies of the immune system, and today it's an acknowledged world leader. Notable among its recent successes is a spectacular breakthrough in the treatment of cancer, a result of collaboration with the Ludwig Institute for Cancer Research. Through the work of Professor Don Metcalf and Dr Tony Burgess and their colleagues, we now have a new family of hormones to treat the blood, to make sure that the blood cells recover after cancer chemotherapy. These CSFs are world beaters, they're world winners, and they're an Australian discovery. Perhaps an inevitable consequence of our technical expertise and increased ability to manipulate the body, some Australian research has moved into areas that raise difficult moral issues. The in vitro fertilization program, for example, goes back over 20 years. And although the first IVF baby in the world was from England, most clinical research since then has been done in Australia, despite ethical objections from some parts of the community. How we handle controversial science like IVF may ultimately have as much impact on the way we practice science and our society as the research itself. But not all research carries such obvious or immediate implications. Pure science, the kind of research that dives off into frontiers as diverse as the taxonomy of sponges or the chemistry of Southern Ocean air, research that maybe seems so esoteric you wonder why it's done in the first place, is ultimately what drives all technology. Although the results may not immediately gel, somewhere down the line there may be new drugs from the sea or clues to the greenhouse effect. It's the kind of research that, while fundamental, lets us reach for the stars, quite literally in the case of the new Australia Telescope. As well as keeping us at the forefront of radio astronomy, it's an excellent example of how cooperation between science and industry can establish a stronger technological baseline in this country, a goal that's seen as vital by many scientists. Science is about making big jumps of innovating things which were never there before. It is those jumps which lead to the new industries of the world. We are attempting in this country, really for the first time, to build up that research expertise within industry, because up to date it's been lacking within the Australian industry. Now, these are start-up companies. They're basically all undercapitalised. The venture capital is difficult to obtain, so it will not be an easy road to hoe. But we have made a beginning, and I think the academic community is solidly behind these initiatives. But where to from here? In 1988, it's just as difficult to see how technology will affect our lives in the next century as it was in 1888. The changes could be just as profound. But if scientific research, especially pure research, stays on the financial back burner, 
the technological revolution could stop cold. maths was just the study of numbers, then this Mathematica gallery is about to undo your definition. Known as the queen of the sciences, maths is in fact the study of patterns and shapes. The parabola, for instance. Wherever you drop a ball vertically onto a parabola, it will always bounce to the same point, its focus. In this case, a metal disc. Light and radio waves travel in the same way, which is why we use parabolas for satellite dishes. This exhibit is called Hit the Disc, and it's one of 20 exhibits here for kids of all ages. Ah, oh, good. Many displays are just like games, but behind the fun lie explanations of some fundamental mathematical principles. Take the downhill slalom. It poses the question, what is the shortest time, as distinct from distance, between two points? You've got two choices, a curve or a straight line. What colour marbles have you got? Red and blue. And where did they go? The red one goes in the curve, the blue one goes in the diagonal. You've had a few goes now. Which one usually gets to the bottom first? The red. You think it'll get there first this time? Yep. All right, let's have a look. So, the red marble wins. And it went down the curve. But this is no ordinary curve. It's called a cycloid, and its unique shape provides the quickest path for rolling or sliding an object downhill. It beats the straight line or any other curve every time. Cycloids are important for industry when it comes to making gear wheels work smoothly and efficiently. They allow gears to mesh without sliding, reducing wear on the metal. If billiards isn't your game, then you might like this ellipse table because your chances of getting a hole in one are almost perfect. All you have to do is place the launch pad on a special spot, the focus, and it will always go in the hole after bouncing off the cushion. This is the first mathematics gallery of its kind. What future do you think there is for mathematics galleries? Well, I think the hands-on side of these exhibits are the way that people will become involved in mathematics. Mathematics is not just abstract, it's a concrete subject as well. So it's not just numbers, it's actually doing things with the numbers that you're thinking about. Of course, without mathematics, there would be no harmony. Shaping every piece of music is a mathematical structure. Here tonight to put some soul into science with the latest in music technology is the internationally acclaimed James Morrison and his quintet.
James Morrison Quintet with their version of a traditional Japanese folk song. In case you were wondering, the electric valve instrument James was playing was programmed to imitate the Japanese flute. All sounds, of course, travel in waves, and here at the centre, they've devoted a gallery to them. Geoffrey Birchfield's been listening in. In case you didn't realise it, this program is being brought to you not just by the ABC, but by courtesy of Waves. In this gallery, the Waves Gallery, there are plenty of examples of how light, sound and many other things that we take for granted obey the same sorts of laws that govern the ripples of water. All around us, the air is full of waves. They may be invisible, but as we'll see, their effects can be far-reaching. Take television, for example. Most of us think of TV as a mystery black box that only an electronics whiz could possibly understand. Not so. Some of its basic principles are really quite simple, and they're on display here in the Waves Gallery. To make a sound, any sound, something has to vibrate. Even just to talk, your vocal cords have to vibrate. So the human voice is really a musical instrument, where those chords are the strings. And if you talk into a microphone, you can see those vibrations as wave patterns. Different sounds make different patterns. And when they're converted to electrical signals, like these, those sounds can be stored on tape for future transmission. But what about the picture on your screen? How is that formed? Well, when you look very closely, the full color image of a TV is made up of tiny phosphorus dots in just three primary colors, red, green, and blue. Although you won't be able to tell from where you're sitting, you're actually seeing three separate images, one for each color. Your eyes interpret them as one. There's a terrific demonstration of this additive colour principle here in the gallery. Red, blue and green lights spill onto a white screen. If you leap in front of them and block the beams, you can cast coloured shadows. But if the three beams hit the screen without interference, surprisingly they combine to make white light. Of course, as many a painter knows, if you mix coloured paints, say red, green and blue, it certainly won't give you white just a mess. That's because of the way that light waves are absorbed and transmitted. And speaking of transmission, once you've created your sound recording and worked out how to make a colour TV picture, the whole lot has to be converted to radio waves and transmitted to your TV set. Now if you're going to broadcast that signal over a long distance, you may need some sort of reflector along the way. But a television signal, like the one that your TV set is picking up right now, contains an enormous amount of complicated information, including sound and picture. So you can't just use just any sort of reflector in case all that information gets scrambled. What you need is something like this. It's a parabolic dish, and it has the remarkable property that it reflects signals accurately and without distortion over thousands of kilometers or even just across this room. Hello, Mike, can you hear me? Very well indeed. This is an excellent demonstration. What sort of response have you had from people to it? I think one of the nicest ones, nicest responses I've ever heard was uh, from a very prominent Australian physicist who said to me, you know, I've known about this principle all my life, but I've never actually had a chance to use it. Fantastic. Whether it's just for fun or to dabble in some science, this gallery will help you reflect on the waves that shape our lives. Geoffrey Birchfield over in the Waves Gallery. Now to the Prime Minister and the official opening of the National Science and Technology Centre. Your Excellency, Mr Yanagai, my ministerial colleagues, Clyde Holding and Barry Jones, Sunil Curry, Wendy McCarthy, Mr Saito, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. 1988 has indeed been a memorable and exciting year for Australians. Our bicentenary has provided a magnificent opportunity, not only for celebration, but for more enduring achievements, which long after 1988 has entered the history books, will be appreciated by future generations of Australians. 
The National Science and Technology Centre is just such a project, innovative, important and enduring. There is, of course, as you know, only a small number of national institutions deemed worthy of location here in the parliamentary triangle, the focal point both of Canberra's formal life and of its tourist activity. The decision to place the National Science and Technology Centre amongst these premier institutions in this area reflects the very high priority the government attaches to it. The centre has a number of major sponsors from Australian industry, but I'm sure I speak for the centre when I say it would be keen to hear from other companies as potential sponsors. There is room for more. I pay tribute to my ministerial colleague, Barry Jones, who has been committed to this project from the start, and I congratulate Dr Michael Gore and his colleagues who brought to the centre the skills and the enthusiasm of Questacon. But perhaps more than anyone else, the government and business community of Japan deserve our most sincere thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, this centre will provide a tremendous boost to Australian science and a major new attraction for school groups and other tourists who come to Australia. This centre will justly stand as an enduring symbol of the friendship between Australia and Japan. I wish the centre well in its future activities. As you know, this centre is all about hands-on scientific experience. And it is now my pleasure, in the hands-on spirit, to declare open the National Science and Technology Centre. for an awful lot of other people who've done a tremendous lot of work over the years, including my great friend Sir Ian McLennan, who helped me start this thing going. Yes, you've had great support, but uh, what the Prime Minister said just now about this being a turning point for Australian science, were you impressed by that? I think that's tremendous. I think you will be impressed by that. I think there's going to be a resurgence of science in this country. It's going to be absolutely magnificent, and we're going to help to lead it too. Yeah, because lots of scientists have felt that there's been uh, some neglect and... Uh, Maybe they're wondering perhaps why we should spend $20 million on a building like this at a time when perhaps CSIRO are crying out for more funds? I think they are all in favour. In fact, I know the scientific community is all in favour of this. And we must bear in mind that Australia paid only half the cost of this building. Our good friends, the Japanese, paid the other half. I must make the point, of course, that the rally did say that they were there in the support of science and not demonstrating against the centre. The rally came to see me about a week ago before they came and they said, we are very much in, in favour of this science centre and we don't want to do anything to upset your opening. One point, it's very glamorous, it's high tech. Do you think it takes you too far away from your roots? Oh no, 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 no. We'll keep our roots, we'll keep the simplicity that Questacon started. We know what the public have said to us, we know what they like, we'll keep to that. And you'll keep, not in the director's office, but hands on yourself? Oh, you better believe it. <laughs> well, Mike Gore, my congratulations. Thanks, Robin. All the very best. Thanks for joining us this evening. Karina. Thanks, Robin. That's our coverage from the National Science and Technology Centre. But it's not all for science this week on ABC TV. Tomorrow night, the Discovery documentary series brings you the story of a remarkable chapter in Australian science history, the story of the Woomera rocket range. For 30 years, one of the most important missile and civilian space centres in the world. That's Discovery tomorrow night at 9.30 on ABC TV. As for the Quantum team, we'll be back next week. See you then. Good night.
Yes, well, wasn't that exciting? Hello, this is Andrew Denton from Blah Blah Blah. If you're wondering why we weren't on tonight, so am I. However, I've since been told that we're on on December the 7th at 8.30pm, our 3D special. Please don't miss it. And as Andrew said, that's December the 7th in two weeks' time. Stay with ABC Now for the Andrew Lloyd weather story following our news update.